I was about 15 minutes from finishing the night shift at work when there was a massive crash on one of the windows in the office. So I get up and go check it out. Someone has thrown quite a sizable rock through one of the windows on the front of the building. This is made especially weird because I'm working in the industrial district at 11.30 at night with none of the other businesses open. I go back to my desk, put a quick call through to security to let them know, and then I decide to head home. As I'm leaving the building, I'm freaking myself out about it more and more and end up running to my car, getting in and taking off as fast as I can. I'm almost home and I've started to calm down a bit when I realize that I didn't unlock my car when I got in. It had been unlocked the whole time. I do a quick check with my hand in the back seat, but there's nothing there. Fast forward 30 minutes. I've called a friend of mine who says he is out drinking at a bar nearby, so I decide I'm going to go join him. I jump on my bicycle and start riding over. I'm riding along the road on my bike. It's a nice night, and I'm in no big rush, just enjoying the moonlight when I hear someone riding behind me. I straighten up and stick to one side of the road. He passes me really slowly, and when he is right beside me, he shoots me a smile that I can only describe as purely insane. I kind of flinch and am taken back as he rides on. That's when I realize he is riding my mom's bike. Needless to say, I turned around and went home, and when I got there, sure enough, her bike is missing and one of my car doors is open. This person was crouched behind me the entire drive home. I remember it was about 9 p.m. and the kids' parents would be getting home in like an hour or so. I had put the kids to bed and so I was downstairs watching TV by myself. However, every so often the TV would flicker with static. To be honest, it was starting to scare me. It wasn't until the point when I looked up from the TV and out of the nearby window when I lost it. There wasn't actually anything outside but it seemed as if it was the reflection. I saw what looked like a tin man standing not too far away from me behind the couch. Needless to say, there wasn't actually anything there when I snapped my head around to look at the spot where it was standing in the reflection. I grabbed all my stuff and wanted to get out of that house then and there. Instead, I ran upstairs and actually sat down quietly where the kids were sleeping until the parents got back home. I particularly remember when the parents came home and I had started to leave. I was pulling out of their driveway in my old Ford Laser and I looked up into the kids' bedroom window. The same reflection I saw earlier was looking back down at me with a hand raised as if waving goodbye. I have never babysat anyone again. I worked at a women's clothing mail order catalog call center. During training, a veteran worker was talking about getting to know the frequent callers and the story of one of them. The old lady used to call in often. She was blind, but would have someone help her pick out things. The manager of her apartment complex, I think. She would order often, and they got to know her by name. Eventually, she stopped calling in so they contacted the number they had for her, which was the apartment manager's number. The old lady was fine, but had to be moved to a new building, because even though she was blind, she was very meticulous with her cleaning. She cleaned everything often. The manager had come in to do some maintenance for the first time in many months. Every room in her apartment, above head level, had thick webs and nests of black widow spiders. Hundreds of them. Can you imagine? An oblivious old lady walking around blind in a house she thinks is spotless, but there is a soul-freezing nightmare swarming all over the ceiling.
One day while doing my laundry, one of the lights blew out in my basement. My basement is set up so that the laundry room is split from the other side of the basement with a wall and a door. In order to get upstairs, you have to exit the laundry room and go through the other part of the basement. Since there was only light on one side, it was really dark. I finished the laundry I had to do while dreading the walk through the dark basement. I exited the laundry room and got halfway through the basement when I heard a loud cackle. Imagine a sound people make when they try to imitate a witch. Take that and imagine that the witch had been smoking for 50 years, making her voice deeper and hoarser. That is what I heard, clear as day, right behind me. I did not look or hesitate. I bolted for the stairs. I waited until my father got home and then changed the light bulb. I have yet to hear that cackle or anything else since, and I have not told a single person in the house about it. About 30 years ago, my mom went on a blind date. Her date took her to a restaurant, and although he was nice enough, she just wasn't into him. Not even halfway through the meal, she was already thinking of ways to leave early. The waiter could tell. While my mom's date was in the restroom, the waiter approached her and asked her if she was okay. She explained that she was on a blind date and not having much fun. It turns out the waiter was just about to get off work. He offered to give her a ride home if she waited another 10 minutes. She considered it and was about to say yes when her date came back from the restroom. She gave a subtle head shake, no, to the waiter and then smiled. She and her date finished their meals and then he took her home. The next night, my mom was watching the evening news. A story comes on about a woman being raped and murdered behind a restaurant the night before. The restaurant was the one that she had been at. They showed the murderer's picture. It was the waiter. My cousin and his family had lived in their house for about five years. His wife left home to drop the baby off at daycare before work, but realized she had left her phone at home. Entering the house, she turned the corner to the hallway and nearly ran into the drop-down attic ladder, which was fully extended. They never used the attic as it was filled with loose insulation. She quietly left the house, drove around the corner and called the police. When the police investigated, they found a short-range transmitter connected to several cameras hidden throughout their home. The light fixture in the shower, the ceiling fan above their bed, even a pinhole in the nursery were sending videos to a nearby location. Their neighbor, a few houses away, had been given a key by the prior owners and installed surveillance equipment once he knew their schedule. My cousin's wife walked in on him updating his equipment, but he forgot something at his house and left to get it when she walked in. He had been watching them for years. My grandpa worked night shifts, so my grandma was home alone most nights. Her sister-in-law, Rose, would randomly come over to keep her company. My grandma decided to go to bed early one night. Rose came over that night to see how she was doing. She went to my grandma's bedroom after calling for her with a reply of, I'm in bed, just come in. Upon entering the room, Rose starts acting weird and telling my grandma that she really wants her to get up and come help her with something in the kitchen. My grandma was ready to go to sleep and was already in bed and really didn't want to. Rose was really adamant for her to come help her, telling her that it was urgent. After a while, my grandma eventually got up and followed Rose to the kitchen. Upon entering, Rose whispers in a panic with tears in her eyes. There's a man under your bed with a knife. 
My grandma, of course, didn't believe her at first, but seeing the panic in Rose's eyes, she knew that she was telling the truth. They proceeded to call the cops and left to the neighbor's house. The cops came and found a man hiding in the closet with a butcher knife. A group of friends was staying at this remote cabin that one of my friend's cousins owned. There were no roads leading to the cabin, and it was a good three or four day hike from where you parked the cars. I couldn't go at the same time as everyone else due to work obligations, so I decided to head up the same day, but later. It would mean I would have to camp for a night by myself though. The latter part of the trail is too dangerous to be taken at night especially for someone who doesn't know it. I didn't care. I was kind of looking forward to it as I've never camped alone before. So I was in the middle of these woods when the sun went down. I got my camp set up in the small clearing, probably 40 feet across. I got my campfire going and pitched a small one-person tent. I did all of that camping stuff like cooking hot dogs on a stick over the fire and made some s'mores. I probably stayed up for a good two or three hours after dark. The entire time, I thought I heard stuff moving in the woods on the edge of the clearing. I didn't think anything of it at first, because the woods are full of animals, but as the night went on, I realized that whatever it was was just circling the clearing, over and over. Once I started paying attention, it made four or five laps around before I decided to get up and investigate. The noise stopped as soon as I stooped up and I thought I heard some sound going away through the woods. I just shrug it off, thinking it was some fox that probably got curious and then got scared when I stood up. I decide it's time to go to sleep. I douse the fire and climb into my tent. I start to doze off and stay in that half-asleep, half-awake state for a while. I normally hear weird things when I'm in this state so I don't think much of it when I hear a voice. Something wakes me completely, and I realize the voice is real and right outside my tent. It's just above a whisper, and I'm not sure if it was another language or if they were speaking English in such a way that I couldn't understand. I lay there for some time, I don't know how long, listening and waiting for something to happen. There is just enough moonlight to light up the walls of the tent so I can see when a hand presses onto the wall of my tent down near my foot. This freaks me out and I sit up quickly. Whoever was outside of the tent disappeared. I could hear them running full sprint through the woods. I get out of the tent and shine my flashlight around and I see nothing. I was expecting there to be a bloody handprint on the tent, but there was nothing. I didn't sleep that night. I packed up my camp at first light that morning and booked it to the cabin. I was playing around with a radio once when I was a kid, just slowly spanning through the static, trying to find a station. I had found an old television antenna, attached it to the side of our house, and ran a wire out my window to it with an alligator clip attached to the radio antenna, allowing me to get a way broader range of signals. So I'm sitting there early in the morning, like 2 a.m., slowly sweeping frequencies, and suddenly I get to this station that's playing this very weird crackling sound. It sounded sort of like cracking knuckles, or maybe Rice crispy cereal, but with a fixed, rhythmic pattern instead of being random. I sat there listening to it for a second, and then it suddenly stopped, and this faint voice said, It doesn't work. We're already dead. We're already dead. It took a second for the weight of the words to hit me, but when they did, I freaked out and almost threw the radio across the room. I'm pretty sure it was just someone messing around with a radio transmitter, but damn if it didn't scare the hell out of me. About five years ago, my mom started dating a guy she met on a dating site. 
I had recently started dating the woman who would later become my wife, and we had met online. My wife and I never really liked this guy. We didn't think he was mean or anything like that, just a little creepy. He was quiet. He kept his eyes closed a lot and occasionally said odd things like offering my wife a chocolate and then popping one in his mouth, closing his eyes, and moaning as he let it melt in his mouth. One time my wife and I were visiting my mom, but she got called into work, so we waited at her house. Her boyfriend was over, but he spent the entire several hours just hanging out in her bedroom with the door closed. Just before Christmas, my mom and this guy started having some difficulties in their relationship. My wife and I were visiting her for the holidays and she dropped all of her problems on us and we listened carefully and gave her our opinions and suggested that she would be better off without him. She already had made up her mind and decided to break up with him on Christmas Eve. We spent the night at my mom's and got up early on Christmas morning to visit my dad at his house. We didn't plan to spend the night at my dad's, but we got snowed in, which was actually a nice Christmas surprise. The next day we left as soon as we could get through the snow, and my wife suggested that we stop by my mom's house on the way so that we could check to see if she was alright. My wife had a really bad feeling about my mom's now ex-boyfriend. My mom's car was in the driveway, but that doesn't mean much because she lives close enough to work that she often walks and it hadn't snowed in her town. She also never locks her door, which drives me crazy. So we let ourselves in. That's when we see blood oozing out of the refrigerator's water dispenser. It had filled up the spill container and was leaking onto the floor and had made a puddle. My wife screamed and I freaked out. I fully expected to see my mom's head in the freezer. I nervously opened the freezer to find a bag of frozen cherries that had been opened, crammed into the freezer so that it fell onto the ice dispenser and melted. A few years back I rented an apartment from a friend of mine. He had recently bought it and had it completely renovated. He put it up for sale but couldn't find a buyer, so I offered to rent it in the meantime. After moving in, I realized there was something wrong with the lady next door. She was about 45, but looked much older. She would sit up all night listening to Christian radio shows and talking loudly to someone. It got to the point where I couldn't sleep, so I went over to her place and asked her to keep it down. She opened her door, and I got a quick peek. Her walls all had crosses painted on them in different colors, and words like Jesus and angels scribbled everywhere. The windows were painted black, letting no light in at all. It was damp, yellow stained 50 year old carpets, dog crap and cockroaches everywhere. No dog though. I asked her to please keep it down. She just looked at me and shut the door. Then she turned up the radio even louder. The next night, I had my girlfriend staying over. I wake up in the middle of the night and see a shadow of a person next to the bed looking at us sleeping. I think I'm hallucinating, as I usually do in the dark when I'm sleepy, but then the shadow starts talking. It's my neighbor, and she's holding something in her hand. She broke in during the night, and who knows how long she was standing there. You should lock your door at night, she says and walks out. The next morning I hear someone making strange noises below my bedroom window. It's my neighbor talking to herself in tongue. At this point I'm beyond scared. She's obviously very ill. I go upstairs and knock on another person's door and ask what the hell is going on. The guy is as scared as I am. Apparently she broke into his apartment one evening as well while he was watching TV with his kids. He got up from the couch to get a snack only to find her behind the couch staring at him holding a power drill. Now I know what she was holding in her hand. At this stage, I'm basically hysterical. I call the cops and they know all about her. Apparently, she is a violent schizo and she hasn't taken her meds, but they can't force her or enter her apartment without her permission because she owns it. 
The only thing they can do is get her when she goes outside. I sat up for the next two weeks waiting for her to run out of cigarettes. When I heard her leave at 2 a.m. to go across the road to the 7-Eleven, I called the cops. They had three cars and a special van over in less than two minutes. They restrained her and threw her in the van and drove off to some institution in less than a minute. It's like she was never there. I never saw her again. I still have nightmares about her looking at me in my sleep. This happened to me when I was about eight years old, and it still scares me to this day. One evening, I went to let my dogs in from the back garden at around 9 p.m. It was pitch black, so I quickly opened the door, and my dogs came bounding in. As soon as they came in, I locked the door, and at this moment, a person on the other side pulled the handle down trying to get into my house. We had a glass door so even in the dark I could see the outline of a man standing there. I ran to my dad, and he ran into the back garden after this man and saw him running down the road. Since then I have closed and locked all doors at the speed of light. One of the scariest things I have ever heard was when I worked in retail. The store I worked at used to do layaway, and that was where I worked. Right by the layaway counter we had three bathrooms, a men's multi-stall, a women's multi-stall, and a family bathroom. Only the family bathroom had a door that locked. All the others had a push-pull swing door. I was in the back cleaning up, when I thought I heard screaming, so I walked out front by the counter. I heard more screaming. I was not sure at first where it was coming from. I ran and checked the men's and the women's bathroom, and they were empty, and I still heard the crying and screaming. It was coming from the family bathroom. I banged on the door, but the yelling and screaming and crying kept going. I called for a manager because I had no way of getting in the door since it was locked. This whole time there is still screaming. After several attempts of trying to open the door, we called 911. We had no idea what was going on, but it didn't sound good. It went on for about 15 minutes at this point, although it felt like forever. And then the sound stopped. No more crying, no more screaming. We banged on the door until the police came. When they finally did, they had to kick the door in since we had no key. As we all stood around and looked in, all we saw was blood all over the place. We were not really sure what happened at first, but the police told us to back up, and that's when they pull out a lady, covered in blood. We all just stood there in shock. She was not moving, and we thought she was dead. They took the lady away. We all had to give statements. This story is not scary in the ghost sense, but for that to happen right behind the door, and not know what is going on, and the utter feeling of helplessness, was very scary to me. To really get my story, you have to have an understanding of my third floor landing. There's a single set of stairs that lead up to it. Once on the landing, it's a T-shape, with an office on the left my bedroom to the right, and straight ahead is a bathroom with a shower. One night, at about 10 p.m., I'm taking a shower before I go to sleep. The glass panels on my shower is that concave, convex glass that blurs everything, so everything was blurred and unclear. As I'm taking a shower, I glance through the glass to the door to the bathroom, and I see a hand reach over to the light switch, all it did was hit the lights. That's it. No noise. No attack. Nothing. It just turned off the lights. So there I am. I just saw someone's hand reach into the bathroom, and now I'm in my shower, and it's pitch black. I've never been so chilled to the bone before. 
Something about being in the darkness of the night, with the only noise being the water hitting the floor beneath me. It just reduced me to the most primal state of pure fear I've ever been in. I eventually get myself to leave the shower, and I hit the lights. The relief that came over me was immense. I've never been able to explain it. The stairs up to the landing are old, and they creak like hell. I would have heard someone come up and go down. No one was there. No one was in my room or the office. What was even more weird, nothing like it has ever happened since. Let me start by saying that I was really only looking to hook up. I had just been dumped by my boyfriend, and am not the bar type, so I figured that an online dating service would be a reasonable option. I used a local personal service, and had been talking to a guy for about two days before agreeing to meet him. His name was Mike, and he had told me that he used online dating because he was suffering from depression and was on medication that made it hard for him to perform. He decided that it was easier to meet girls this way than to meet up in person and then have to explain when they started getting physical. He went on to tell me, though, that he had a good feeling about me and that I was exciting to him despite his medication. Okay. I was cool with this and decided to go over to his place to see if we really did have chemistry since we both seemed to be looking for the same thing, a hookup. When I got there, he was waiting for me in the living room, and we started making out. I could tell that he was getting a little aroused, but was having some issues, and so when he said that he knew what would help, and that it was in his bedroom, I willingly followed. Walking in, I couldn't help but notice his bed, surrounded by cat condos. Lots of cat condos. Some structured to be as tall as I was. I knew he had cats, but I assumed he meant one or two, and that they were just hiding when I came over. Nope. He had ten, which all came out from under the bed when we sat on it, and all went to their perches on the cat condos to watch us, after rubbing against him and being petted quickly. He then proceeded to start making out with me again, and was, well, massively aroused at this point. I was massively creeped out. I like cats, I have two myself, but having them watch me pee freaks me out, much less watching me have sex. I excused myself, openly admitting that this was too weird for me, and left. He followed me and begged me to give him another chance, and help him. I left. For the next few days, he messaged me, asking me to come over and saying that he had made progress with me. I blocked him after receiving a photo of him nude on the bed, surrounded by the cats. I am the oldest of three kids. I have a younger sister, who was eight at the time of this incident, and a brother, who was six, while I myself was twelve. For years, we lived in a relatively rural area. We weren't too far from a bigger city, but we couldn't see our nearest neighbors from our house and we had plenty of space to play. These were the happy times. My dad worked from home for one of the countless companies that started up during the big dot-com boom in the 90s, and made a good bit of money. That all ended with the crash in the early 2000s. My father lost his job, 
so we were forced to sell our house and move to a less expensive place in the city while he looked for work. The house must have been glamorous in its day. It was three stories and very spacious, even containing two staircases leading upstairs, a main one in the front and a smaller one in the kitchen. Sadly, the house hadn't been kept up and was not in good shape anymore. It was also not in the best neighborhood. It wasn't exactly a ghetto, but it was definitely run down. That's how we managed to get it for a price we could afford. I remember being excited at the time, because even as a little girl, I was always interested in ghosts and monsters, and it seemed like we were moving into a haunted house. I wish this was a ghost story, but sadly, as they say, the living are more terrifying. During this time, my dad changed from the loving father he had always been to someone completely different. Someone we were all very much afraid of. He struggled to find any stable work and began drinking, which would make him very violent and abusive. Most of the time, it was over money. He could drink away every last cent, but how dare my mother buy food or an occasional toy for us? His rage was usually directed at my mom, but if any of us kids dared draw his attention during one of his rampages, he was always more than willing to turn on us and share the love. As the oldest, I was very protective of my younger siblings, so I would usually round them up and quietly head across the street to a small park whenever my dad would start in. That way we were safer. If we didn't make him angry, he would leave us alone. Usually, we'd head back around dark, and he would be in bed passed out by then. One night, however, he was in a particularly foul mood. The yelling was worse than ever. I even heard him from the playground across the street a few times. When darkness rolled around several hours later and we headed home, I could still hear him yelling at my mom from the inside. Then I heard my mother scream in pain and fear, and the sound of breaking glass. I knew something was wrong. I knew something was worse than usual. I told my brother and sister to go to the neighbors and get help, but my sister was terrified and wouldn't leave my side, so my six-year-old brother ran next door alone while we cautiously approached the house. When we got inside, we saw that our mom was lying in the middle of the living room floor bleeding. The furniture in the room was overturned, and the glass coffee table was shattered all over the floor. When she saw us, a look of terror came into her eyes, and she gasped, Run! But it was too late. My dad had heard us coming in, and had hidden behind the front door, which he slammed shut and stepped in front of. In his hand was a large kitchen knife soaked in my mother's blood. His eyes were filled with rage. We did the only thing we could and ran into the kitchen for the back door, but he was fast enough to cut us off before we could get outside. He flipped over the kitchen table in front of the door and screamed, Where do you think you're going? We scrambled into the back staircase and I slammed the door separating it from the kitchen and locked it. We were far from safe. There was nowhere for us to go but upstairs. My father beat on the door for several seconds and then stormed off towards the main staircase. I quietly opened the door and pulled my sister toward the basement instead of going up. Downstairs, we had a playroom and a small living room. I slid the love seat out from the wall enough for my sister to get behind it and lay down and then pushed it back as close to the wall as I could without crushing her. 
I did the same thing for myself with the couch. We laid there in terror for what felt like hours. I could hear my father almost shaking the house in his rage, upstairs looking for us. It sounded like he was flipping furniture and breaking down doors. Eventually he figured out we weren't up there, and did the same thing on the ground floor. Finally, I heard him coming down to the basement, and I cried silently in terror. Just as I could see his feet step off the final stair, there was a crash upstairs, and lots of footsteps rushing into the house. My dad retreated into the dark corner of the basement, until eventually the police worked their way downstairs and arrested him. Even after they took him away, I was still too scared to move. They eventually found us and took us upstairs, where my mother was being loaded into an ambulance. She survived, although I believe he would have killed her if we hadn't come home at that moment. We have never seen my father since. He wrote from prison a few times, but my mom never let us read the letters. She did tell us he said he was sorry, but that's all she would say. We never went to visit him and moved across the country shortly after. He is still locked up as far as I know. As you can imagine, the entire family spent years in counseling after that night. My younger sister has attempted suicide twice, and I still have nightmares and trust issues to this day. I don't think any of us will ever completely get over it. I'm 24 now, and I still live with the effects of this one night to this day, when someone who is supposed to protect you and care for you turns into the one you should be afraid of. It's pretty traumatic. You never fully get over that, and you never truly trust anyone ever again. The personal part of this story was told to me by my friend's older brother, Jay, and his mom. The rest is common knowledge around my hometown. When Jay was about 10 years old, in 1992, an ice cream truck started driving around town. It was in the middle of summer. The truck stopped at all the lakes and parks in our town, and nobody thought much of it. Because our town is small and rural, and of course we have an ice cream truck. Being ten, Jay was excited whenever he heard the ice cream truck drive around. That is, he was excited until he actually convinced his mom to give him some money and let him buy an ice cream. He sprinted to the truck, which stopped a block from his house, but he got a very funny feeling from the guy. He is one-fourth Native American. His mom is half, and is an actual medicine woman, and the whole family believes heavily in trusting their intuitions. So Jay backs away and goes home, even though there was a group of three or four boys at the truck already. He told his mom about his inexplicable feeling of unease when he saw the man, and his mom told him to stay away if the man didn't feel right. A couple weeks later, Two boys went missing while they were out at a park. Their moms had turned their backs for less than a minute. At first, it was assumed that they went exploring to the nearby creek looking for salamanders. But after hours of searching, it came out that the last vehicle seen in the area was the ice cream truck. Then the truck stopped showing up for a few days. Cue the police asking the town officials about the ice cream man. It turns out that nobody knew the guy. He didn't fill out paperwork, or get a license, or whatever it is you have to do to drive your child bait through town. Nobody had thought anything of it, cause this guy just showed up and seamlessly started driving his route one day. I guess he had scouted the locale beforehand in another car or on foot, and picked out all the areas with kids. The driver couldn't contain himself for long, 
and started driving his truck around the shittiest of my town's seven trailer parks a week after the boys went missing. This trailer park is literally on the wrong side of the tracks, with a railroad running right down the side, and our town dump is just a little farther down the street. It's at the very edge of town, with nothing else around it but empty woods. I forgot to mention, my town is in rural Michigan, so this trailer park was about a mile deep into the woods. So the cops were called, and were told that the guy was living in this trailer park. They found his truck with a tarp haphazardly thrown over it, and burst into the nearby trailer and arrested him. Since this is where the local legend starts taking over, I don't really know what they found inside the trailer. I have heard that the trailer was full of memorabilia from past children, and I have heard it was just a shitty trailer that looked like a hobo with a roofing plastic fetish had lived there. I do know that the guy ended up confessing after police found some evidence in his trailer, telling the police that he had kidnapped, raped, and murdered the two boys, finally dropping their bodies at the dump down the street. It was the grisliest thing to happen in my town's history, and a few years later when I was growing up, things were much more strict. There are cameras at all the parks now, an organized neighborhood watch program, and a see-something-say-something law was enacted. Once smartphones became popular, I downloaded the sex offender database app and set it to my hometown. My hometown is Sex Offender Central. There are a dozen sex offenders living in the downtown area, maybe ten blocks by ten blocks, and over three dozen within the boundaries of my school district. Hell, one lived less than a mile away from me, on some dark, wooded dirt road. I have gone running in the middle of the night down that road more times than I can count. I remember back in the day when I was in either first grade or kindergarten, my grandparents' house was robbed, and at the time, I was living there. Fortunately, I wasn't harmed at all, my mom had quickly ran to my room to prevent me from being harmed and to ensure that I was safe and sound. The criminal appeared to be in his teens, 16 to 18 years old according to my grandparents' maid. To be honest, that experience wasn't really that scary, but what happened before that scares me to this day. Around a week or so before the criminal robbed my grandparents' house, my dad had a meeting on the balcony late at night. You might be asking, what's the point of me telling you that my dad had a meeting? Well, during the meeting, my dad's co-worker came to my room to ask where the meeting was. I told him it was on the balcony. However, hours later, and quite possibly after the meeting, someone else entered my room. Well, more like peeked his head into my room. I stared at him while he said nothing and stared at me. After thirty seconds of silence, I said, The meeting is on the balcony. But he said nothing. Then after a few minutes, he went away. The man was wearing a black mask. That's all I can remember. The reason I noticed him was because I had trouble sleeping back then and turned the lights on for the entire night. That experience still traumatizes me. What if he wasn't that young and wasn't a simple criminal that steals your wallet? I could have died or had been kidnapped that night. I am thankful that didn't happen. Please note, the criminal was never caught. So this happened when I was 11 years old. 
My parents and I had just moved from one state to another in the USA. We had just finished unpacking all of our stuff, and I was about to start my first day at a new school, in the third state in four years. I was already nervous and didn't want to go to school, but my parents insisted I go so that I could make friends. Since we had just moved there, and my dad was working, but not my mom, she stood with me outside the house waiting for the bus to come early in the morning. On this morning, there happened to be a really tattered-looking minivan parked across the street from our house. Its windows were covered in duct tape and cardboard, and it was streaked with mud and dirt. The driver of the van was staring us down through the window next to the door. My mom was about to open the door to let the dog out, and he opened his door, looking like he was getting ready to sprint from it. When she closed the door, he did the same. Once more, she tried to open the door, and he copied her. And then she closed it again, and he looked very frustrated as he closed his door. Eventually, my mom went and grabbed the phone and started dialing the police. Once he saw her with the phone in her hand, he sped off, and she gave a description of the guy and his van, including the license plate number. Later, we found out that the man was arrested carrying an unregistered pistol, a couple rolls of duct tape, a baseball bat, several knives, and a package of huge black garbage bags. I'm not exactly sure how that would have ended, but I have a pretty good idea. During the summer of 2014, my parents had left for a weekend trip to Cape Cod. I was 16 and in great physical shape from boxing, baseball, and basketball. So, big deal. My mom had made some pulled pork and pasta for me to heat up to eat whenever, and I had some money if I wanted to order pizza. Things were all good. First night I was alone, I stayed up till three in the morning playing Xbox. So I woke up really late the next day. I checked my phone when I woke up and saw it was a little past one. I threw myself out of bed and stumbled into the shower. I take really long showers, so when my parents are gone, I go mental. I was in there for about 45 minutes, when I heard my front door open. The bathroom is directly up the stairs from the back door, which is pretty loud when it opens and closes. I immediately froze since I obviously was supposed to be alone. I waited for about two minutes, ears straining to hear anything else. Nothing. I figured it was just the wind, or maybe my parents were home early, so I turned off the shower, wrapped my towel around myself, and slowly walked down the stairs to check it out. The staircase to the kitchen is pretty tight and walled in, so it's essentially like walking down a tunnel that's perpendicular to the kitchen, so I can't see into the kitchen when I walk down. Even though my house is old as shit, and each step on the stairs makes a super loud creak, I still took my time and tried to be as quiet as possible. I probably took 45 seconds walking down all 12 of the stairs. So when I get to the second to last stair, right before I could see around the corner into the kitchen, I take a little breath to compose myself. In my mind, I knew I was being stupid. There obviously wasn't anything in the kitchen. There was no way I wouldn't have heard another noise from the burglar, who at any rate would have no reason to be in my kitchen. After mentally chastising myself for being such a wuss, I chuckle to myself for being so stupid and just normally walk the last two stairs and turn the corner into the kitchen. Standing about two feet away from me in the middle of my kitchen, 
was a towering skeleton of a man, dressed in all black, staring straight at me, perfectly still, with a massive smile across his face. Just staring at me. Though the thing I remember most vividly wasn't his face or his smile, but his arms. They were pointing forward, rotated to the point where they were almost completely reversed. I don't know why I remember this so well, but it's just the most demonic position I've ever seen. Ironically, he bore a striking resemblance to the evil priest in There Will Be Blood. Honest to God, I almost had a heart attack right there. Looking back, I can realize how creepy the situation was, but in the moment I just took a step towards him and punched him as hard as I could in the jaw, knocking him to the ground. The second my blow connected, I jetted up the stairs so fast the towel around my waist flooded to the floor, leaving me naked. At this point, my heart was beating out of control, but I managed to make it to my bedroom. I locked the door behind me, then put a chair up against the doorknob. Safe for the moment. I called 911 nearly in tears, telling the operator my situation. As I sat on the floor in the fetal position, staring at the door and praying that the cops would get there soon, I noticed the stream of light poking through the gap between the door had stopped, standing outside of my door. There's no words to describe the feeling I had. Simply put, I was paralyzed with fear, watching the shadow across the bottom of the door shift like the tide. I stayed balled up, staring at the gap, praying the man would go away for what seemed like an hour. All the while, the 911 operator was asking, Hello? Sir? Sir? Are you there? Hello? I didn't want to make a sound, and even if I wanted to lift the phone to my mouth, I don't think I could have. Eventually, the light flooded my door gap again and I heard the faintest of footsteps, slowly creaking the wooden floorboards as he walked down the hall. It was silent for minutes as I just sat there curled up, unable to move a muscle. Nowadays, I check every lock in the house before going to bed. I still get nightmares occasionally, and my heart starts racing whenever I see someone standing still. Oh yeah, and I can never watch There Will Be Blood again. But I'm doing all right. The police never found whoever's in my house. That fact sends shivers down my spine every time I look outside, as I half expect to see him standing across the street, smiling under a lamppost. I'm a 22-year-old woman who just moved to a small town in Virginia with my dad in October of 2015. We were having problems with a leaky shower in the bathroom adjacent to mine. You know, typical new house problems. Of course, we called a plumber, who arrived at around 8 the next morning, while I was getting ready for work in my own non-dysfunctional bathroom. My dad let him in then apparently went down the street to gas up his car and then go to work, leaving the plumber and I alone in the house. My bathroom consists of just a toilet and vanity, with a door leading into the shared shower room that connects to my dad's bathroom. So while I was getting ready, there was only a door between the plumber and I. I guess he figured out that I was in the house due to my hair dryer. Next thing I know, my bedroom door is opening and there's a toothless behemoth of a man in the room, like Wario and Waluigi combined into one big plumbing mess. He locked my door behind him, then walked five feet towards me, stopping in front of my bathroom door. I froze, all while he was staring at me for the longest thirty seconds of my life. Breaking his stare, 
He cracked a wide, toothless grin and starts molesting with his eyes, gazing up and down my body like he was sexually sizing me up. Just then, I heard the front door open. The plumber twirled around on one foot like a basketball player, unlocked my door, and walked out. My dad ran in, asking if that guy had really just been in there. After silently nodding, my dad ran after him, but the freak had driven off at this point. Oh, and he left without fixing our shower. My dad immediately called the plumbing company and tried to explain what happened to the manager, who proceeded to tell my dad it was our fault the man entered my room because I didn't lock it. The asshole did end up sending another plumber to fix the shower. Afterward, my dad told me that he had only returned to the house because he had forgotten his wallet. So, I spent around three months on a wilderness excursion group called NOLS. For the first segment, we spent two and a half weeks packing through the Gila National Forest. Now, to give you an idea of how far into the backcountry we were, we carried all our food for around six to seven days apiece, found our own water, and wiped our asses with rocks. Got the idea now? Good. So, at about five days into our first ration, we're meeting a pickup truck on a remote dirt road the next day and had to take a shortcut so that we wouldn't miss it. If we did, we'd have to wait another week for food and we were already pretty low. We made the decision to cut through a section of private property in order to shave a half day of travel and make it to our location on time. However, we weren't able to make it all the way through this property and still be able to camp near water access. Well, we scoped out the area and found that there were a couple of run-down old hunting shacks, but they mostly looked abandoned or just used during the hunting season. We found a nice grassy field to build a camp on and a soft bed under some pine nettles to set up our kitchen area. Well, we've got dinner going on our camp stoves, tent set up, sun is rising, and from the trees we see a hound bounding over and a long bearded haired hermit dude screaming at us. If you've never been out in the wild or lived in a rural area, there are two types of people you will find being hermits. One the kind that are absolutely insane and have spent the last 40 years eating the wrong kind of mushrooms and own gun collections that will put a city armory to shame or two the kind of person who's moved away from people in order to find inner peace and commune with nature we were pretty on the fence on which one this guy was well he comes running over shouting at us saying, who the hell are you and what the hell are you doing on my land? Not wanting to get shot or murdered in the middle of nowhere, we tried to calmly speak to him. We explained that we didn't know that we were trespassing. We were just passing through on our way to our ration meetup, and that we were very sorry, and that we can leave if he wants. He asks how long we're staying for, and we told him just for the night, and that we would be gone by first light. He seemed to not have a problem with that. That went smoother than expected. Turns out, he used to be a raging alcoholic and a motorcycle enthusiast. He got ripped drunk at a bar last night, tried to ride home on his bike, and he crashed somewhere along the way. Woke up three days later in the hospital. His BAC was over the lethal limit, and by no rights he should have lived through that. That day, his wife issued him an ultimatum give up drinking forever or lose her and the kids. When he left the hospital, he found a real estate office, asked for the most remote plot of land available, 
and built a house on there. He told us that all his friends were drunks and that he couldn't be around them and he had to move where he didn't know anyone and he found this plot of land, built himself a house and makes furniture out of white aspen. He invited us up to his workshop the next morning and I was glad that when we woke up no one was missing. Next day he showed us this shop, introduced us to his lovely wife and we said our goodbyes. We started saying goodbye with handshakes and by the end of it he was giving bear hugs with tear in his eyes. And that's the story of Crazy Harold. When I was 17, I was always in Yahoo chat rooms. I was always chatting with people in the local Seattle rooms. Well, this one guy and I chatted a lot and decided to meet. We met at a Herfie's for lunch, and when he showed up, it was obvious the guy had lied about everything. The age, what he looked like. The guy even admitted that he lied about having a job and he shows up to Herfie's on the bus. So we eat and I say it was nice and then I have to go. As I walk away, this guy starts following me. I walked to a burger joint because I didn't live very far and I didn't want this guy to follow me home. My mum was a flight attendant and was out of town. My mum had about a week left until her days off from flying so I really didn't want this weirdo knowing where I lived. I started telling the guy I had some appointment to take care of to try and shake him off from following me, but he insisted it was okay and would go with me for the company. Not knowing what else to do, I stopped at a bus stop and waited for the bus to downtown Seattle. He stopped too and got on the bus with me. The whole ride he kept trying to talk to me asking me all sorts of questions. I would answer with the bare, bare minimum and fill him with lies because I didn't want him to know anything about me now. At one point he tried putting his arm around me and I just leaned away. So he tried putting his hand on my thigh and I told him I didn't know him well enough for him to touch me. I felt sick to my stomach the whole bus ride, trying to rack my brain with what the hell I do once I got downtown. Once downtown, I walked over to the building where my best friend's mother worked. Since I knew the layout of the building, I could play it off. I told him I had to use the restroom. I asked the woman at the cafe if I could use the restroom, and she agreed. So there's a service delivery door outside that leads to this hallway. And this hallway has doors that lead to all the different shops and a service elevator to take things slash merchandise to the other shops on the other levels. So I exited the cafe through the back door and into the hallway and left the building out the door next to the docking bay. I took this as my chance to make my way to a bus stop to go home. I was going to take the express bus and just get off at the airport instead of the other bus that takes forever. Well, as I make my way to the bus stop, I see the guy in the cafe still waiting for me. I managed to make it onto the bus and never saw the guy again. However, a few nights later, I was on Yahoo chat again, when someone messaged me, and I told him I wanted to see a picture to know who I was talking to. He sent one. I see the picture and instantly pick up the phone and call one of my friends. The friend I call, his mum and aunt were really good friends with my mum and aunt, and our grandmother had been close friends too, back in eastern Washington before either of us were born. So he answered and I started talking to him. Hey, are you on Yahoo chat right now? No, why? Someone is trying to talk to me and they gave me a picture of you claiming it was them. Well, I go back to talking to the guy online and he admits that it's not a picture of him. He admits who he is and he said that he felt we had a great connection, but lost me when we went downtown. He started to profess his love to me and everything. I cussed at the guy and told him I lost him on purpose. Then I changed my Yahoo name and never met anyone from Yahoo chat room in person ever again.
I have a couple of creepy experiences that I can share from my third year of medical school, which is when everything is still new to you, when you have no idea what to expect or how to handle some of the stuff. So, psych rotation at the state mental hospital. We went in to evaluate a middle-aged woman with a history of visual hallucinations and erratic behaviour. Through most of the interview, she looked at the floor and responded slowly with one-word answers. Very flat effect and clearly schizophrenic, but not really endorsing any of the symptoms that brought her to the hospital. All of a sudden, I'm thanking her for her time and about to leave the room. She jumps up and grabs the lapels of my white coat, surprisingly hard, and pulls, and gets right up into my face, close enough for her breath to fog my glasses. I didn't say a word. I just had the most intense look of fear on my face, and she just stared right at me, breathing hard. I froze. I didn't know whether to push her away or to say anything, and I had no idea what she was going to do. It lasted maybe four seconds before other staff came to help, but those few seconds were absolutely terrifying. This following incident happened at Hepatology Rotation, which for non-medical folk is the liver disease service, mostly alcoholics with cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is a rough disease and is eventually fatal without a transplant. Alcoholics tend to not qualify for transplants in general because most of them won't stop drinking and don't have adequate social support and are too deconditioned to do well after the transplant. And we only want to give our short supply of organs to those who will get the most medical benefit. You don't want an alcoholic to get organs, keep drinking and not get out of bed after the surgery, only to die next year anyway or scar up the next liver from alcohol abuse. So anyway, most of the patients I saw were in that situation, with bad symptoms and no hope for a transplant. Most of them had severe hepatic encephalopathy as well, which is delirium and confusion because of basic metabolic toxin waste that builds up and affects the brain because the liver can no longer get rid of it. I remember one patient who was really out of it, couldn't even get words out, just grunts and moans. He didn't have long left, and the family had just decided to stop treating the disease and make him as comfortable as he could so that he could die at home in peace. I walked in that morning to stop and get some meds, get him ready and send him home to do my physical discharge, and he's sitting up and eating a bowl of cereal looking lucid. It surprised the hell out of me. He normally couldn't control his movements at all. No way this guy could manage to eat cereal or hold a spoon. I cautiously asked how he was doing today, who I hadn't heard him utter a word the whole month he'd been there. He'd been on my service, and he said, I'm dying soon. I haven't got a lot of time. My jaw about hit the floor. Then he was out of it again. He dropped the spoon and spilt the cereal all over himself. I figured the lucidity was some sort of freak occurrence and I went to their bedside to examine him. Halfway through the exam, he stops groaning and looks lucid again and says, Well, I'm out of here, and then immediately slumps back into a V-fib arrest. I think about that moment every time I have a dying delirious patient. I'm always half expecting some crazy moment where they become lucid and call their own death like that. I always wonder how he knew or what feeling he had to make him say that. I used to work in this place as staff for a non-profit and one night the security guard called out and I was the only person to take his place. Why this building stayed open until 10 p.m. I don't know, because everyone went home at 7 p.m. The building was big and old-fashioned, even though the company owned one side. All I had to do was sit at a desk, watch the cameras, and lock up once 10 p.m. came around, and wait 
for our truck driver to pick up some artwork. It's almost 10pm and the truck driver is on his way and the old elevator starts to move. It's on the fifth floor and it starts coming down. I'm freaked out because no one is on the fifth floor. I saw the last person go home two hours ago. So I grab the baton and go upstairs to investigate. Since the elevator is in motion, I am terrified of it. As I'm going straight up to the second floor, I hear footsteps that sound like high heels down the lobby. I rush back downstairs, thinking I've never locked the front door, but it's not open. The elevator door opened, and no one was inside. I thought it was maybe my boss messing with me, so I started to call out his name whilst walking up the stairs. No one was on the second floor, so I continue up the stairs and hear the elevator move once again. It's on its way to the fifth floor. When I get to the third floor, the creepiest of all of them, the elevator stops above and I hear footsteps. I finally get to the fifth floor and no one is there but some creepy statue at the end of the hall. I can't believe I even had the guts to close up the floor and leave. So I get past the fourth floor and I'm back on the creepy third floor and I almost shit my pants at the sight of something moving from the corner of my eye. No big deal. It's probably a roach. Keep going. The truck driver will be here soon. Nope. I look again and the outline of a skinny kid with messy hair runs by the door of the president's office at the end of the hall. Oh no. I didn't turn off the light shit. And as I find some massive balls and pick them up, I move towards the president's office and the elevator starts moving again and there are footsteps in the staircase at the same time. I start to break down and want to cry right there in the hallway. I have no idea what to do, so I run into the meeting room and cower near the windows because if I see that kid or something else in the building, I'm ready to jump. I hear the elevator doors open on my floor and my name being called softly. Jasper. Jasper. I start screaming for it to leave me alone. The footsteps are getting closer to the meeting room. The door opens and I don't look because I have my eyes closed. I grab the baton and as soon as I swing, some force stops it. It's the truck driver. I was so relieved to see him that I collapsed in his arms and bawled for a good minute. He got me all cleaned up, helped me close up and gave me a ride home. Right as we got down the street from the building, he turns to me and says, You didn't know that place was haunted? Jim, my boss, had been talking about Tommy for years. Turns out Tommy was a boy who died of pneumonia in that home in the early 1900s. When I looked at one of the historical books we had on the mansion, that skinny kid with shaggy hair was in it. Seriously, screw that place. A couple of years ago, I was sailing on a ship that maneuvered offshore with pipeline that ran to shore about half a mile off. As the ship was unhooking from the pipe, the line that was used to haul the pipe to the ship connection got wrapped around a person's leg and sucked him through the rails. He fell about 30 feet into freezing water and the general alarm sounded for a man overboard, which woke me up at around five. I woke up all confused to find everyone frantically running around on deck. Once I realised it was no drill, I ran to the starboard side, and there were around three life rings in the water, and one was around three feet from the guy, but he couldn't reach it. He had a work vest on that was keeping him afloat. Hypothermia had set in, and he was moving slow, 
and was yelling for help. At this point it was clear he wasn't grabbing the life rings, so half the crew and I ran over to the rescue boat to unhook it, while the other half tried getting him on the ship. It seemed like it took forever to get the rescue boat down. The hold down straps were rusted and took a bit to get off. The cover was still on the boat and it was a bitch to get off. And the hoist is the slowest hoist, which seemed to take 10 minutes to finally get into the water. Finally, we get two guys in the rescue boat, in the water, and let the bow line off. And then the rescue boat engine cuts out. Luckily, it started right up again. At that point, I ran back to the starboard side and everyone was yelling, where is he? One of the mates said, we had him on the ladder, but his leg is still caught in that line. We couldn't get it free, and he got sucked under the ship. At this point, everyone seemed to go silent. I looked down and saw the guy's boot float by. The next guy came to me and said, he's gone. After a few nerve-wracking seconds, the crew in the rescue boat radioed that they found the guy bobbing in the water face down and still attached to the hoist line. He was unconscious and not breathing. At this point, the rescue crew tried pulling the guy on board and with the swell of the sea and the way the boat hit his chest made him spit up water and come to. The radio crew radioed back that he was conscious. The line was removed from his leg and he was pulled fully onto the boat. The boat headed straight to shore where the beach crew and an ambulance were waiting. They were able to get the guy some coats and put them on him, and he was conscious enough to understand what was going on but not to speak. The ambulance took him, where he was sent to the ER for hypothermia and drowning. The guy's life vest saved his life in more ways than one. It kept him afloat and kept him visible. I say it kept him visible, because if you blinked and he didn't have a life vest on, you would have never seen him again. Things luckily didn't result in a death, but easily could have, due to the temperature of water, visibility, equipment failure and reaction time. This is the scariest thing that has ever happened to me while sailing, and the look of terror on the guy's face is still with me, and the feeling of utter hopelessness to help even though he was a mere few feet from the ship. He spent a few days in the hospital and miraculously suffered no serious injuries, except near death. I was on a cross-country road trip with a colleague. We were driving through West Texas on a major highway. In the area where we were, even the major highway was pretty desolate. There had been a truck stop or gas station about every hundred miles, and every one of them was solitary, with no other buildings in sight. There weren't really towns, the exits, just places to get to more gas stations to the next gas station. It was pretty late at night, and she had been driving for four hours. I usually can drive for about eight before I'm tired, but she could only manage four or five before it was my turn. We were getting low on gas, about a quarter of a tank, and you learn from road travel to fill up when you get a chance. So she was looking for a gas station as we drove along. It's really corny but we were talking about fate and destiny and some other weird shit at the time. That kind of conversation gets me keyed up and worried, so I was trying to change the subject. She took an exit whilst we were talking, and I got out my coffee mug so that I could fill it up during my turn for driving. We pulled up into a typical nowhere gas station, just the station and the trailer out back. I assume, thinking back, it was probably where the people who owned it lived. There was another car parked out in front of the doors off to one side. We got out 
still talking, and we walked up to the double doors, each of us grabbing a door handle. The door was locked. I turned and looked around to see if there was a sign. Some places will put a back in five minutes. And then I noticed several things in succession. The coffee maker inside was halfway done brewing a fresh pot of coffee. The monitors that showed the store were visible from outside, but all of them were showing static. And there was a splash of bright red on the door in the back of the place, which was closed. I suddenly realised I was looking at a huge streak of blood with handprints in it. Every hair on my neck stood up. My friend began shaking the door yelling, We need to get gas! But I had already turned and walked away from the doors. We have to leave now. I grabbed her arm and started propelling her back into the car. Now I noticed the other car in the lot. It had no plates. It was dingy and had dents. There was an empty gun rack in the window. I ran into the car, dragging her in with me. She seemed to take forever to open her hot door and get in. The whole time she was just saying that we needed the gas. Whilst I tried to explain to her that there was blood in there. Blood! After what seemed like a year, she pulled the car out when we were backing up. I saw through the windows that the back door of the gas station was open. We had pulled away before anyone thankfully came out. I freaked out until we were about 20 miles away down the highway. I tried to call the police but we had no signal. And I didn't get phone signal until we had driven about 40 miles and got to another truck stop. Again, not a town. Just a building on its own out in the middle of the nothingness. I called the cops, they thanked me, and I never heard any more about it. But to this day, I feel like if I hadn't have freaked out, we probably would have met the robbers or whoever was in the back room of the place. I also wish I'd have been able to find out what the hell happened there. It was a Chevron station, somewhere in the western part of Texas. At least within about a hundred miles or so of the signs for those places, on Route 10. I was in Tesco, a generic wholesale shop that we have here in England, and just innocently browsing the DVD section on my own. I was looking at the new releases, but not paying too much attention. My friend's parents were always away on holiday, and she was having a sleepover. Girls night at hers, and had asked me to get a scary horror film for us to watch. Whilst looking, I heard, So you like movies, eh? I turned around and saw this guy who looked to be around 70 years old. He had greasy hair, but what struck me the most is that he was wearing socks and sandals. Yeah, that kind of made me smirk. I looked at him and just said, Yep, and proceeded to carry on down the aisle. He followed me and started talking about films that he'd seen, what I should get, etc. I just replied, yeah, okay, whatever, and was reaching the end of the aisle. I'm a girl, 23, but must have looked younger, as I didn't have that much makeup on, and I have dark brown long hair. This old guy was still following me, and asking me where I'm going, do I have a boyfriend? Do I like oral? And if I am alone? That was it for me. I turned around, looked him dead in the eyes, and said, Piss off, you hillbilly pervert, and walked off into the shop. I had gotten some ice cream and some popcorn and was now in my car driving to my friends, singing along, badly, to the radio. I'm not so sure how long it had been there, but I noticed a silver pickup taking the same turns as I was. I was only doing around 50 in a 70 area, and they could have easily have overtaken me if they'd wanted to. But it stayed right behind me, my friends turning past me,
but I could take the next turning and double back on myself through the back roads. I didn't indicate. Something I regret now and realised that this was very stupid of myself. I took the turning and drove as fast as I could to her house. And as I did, I saw the car take the same turning as me. She lives in a cul-de-sac area, and I parked my car down the road, not in front of hers, and ran into her garden. She always keeps the gate open, and I didn't know how long it would be before she'd have to open the main door, so I chose the garden. I locked the gate behind me, and knocked on the back door. After being let in and being called a weirdo and peeping Tom, I got handed some wine. Not a minute later, there was a knock on the door. My friend opened it. It was the creepy guy from Tesco, with his silver car in the middle of the road. He was standing there, saying something along the lines of, his daughter's car had broken down, and she had rung up from a house along this street, and he's here to pick her up. Is she here? He described me, and what I was wearing. My friend said no, and shut the door in his face and locked it. I hadn't told them about the creepy guy, I'd only just got there. But she said there was something off about him, and wasn't my dad. No way I would have ever have known him. We saw through the curtain that he went to every other house in the cul-de-sac. He would get turned away, and then move on to the next one. We later found a piece of paper in a plastic sandwich bag left on my car windshield. It said, Where did you go? I wasn't finished with you. It was the summer of 2004. My family was supposed to vacation in Kennebunkport, Maine. My father was stuck in meetings, so he was going to come up from Manhattan a few days after us. My mom wanted to drive up, super annoying to me at the time, but we didn't have a choice, and my brother, sister, and I loaded into the car and started to drive. I was about 14 at the time. The drive was uneventful, but there were various delays, and we ended up getting there a lot later than originally planned. Because of this, the owners of the house that we were renting had turned in for the night, and we weren't able to get a hold of them to get the keys. Sounds like horrible planning, but apparently they were pretty strict about the time frame to pick up the keys. My mom, unfazed, decided she wanted lobster so we went to one of our favorite spots. She called my dad to see if he could make us reservations at a hotel in Kennebunkport from New York City while we ate. We were enjoying the lobster while the guy came up and started chatting with my mom. I figured it was just a friendly local making conversation. During this, my dad calls my mom and my mom excuses herself to speak to him. Apparently, all the hotels were booked for the night. The plan was for us to drive to the nearest town and just find somewhere to stay until we could pick up the keys for our vacation home. Apparently, the local had been listening to my mom's conversation and came back over once she got off of the phone. I want to say, there was nothing outwardly off about him. He was preppy, clean-cut, unassuming, and fit in with the clientele. He told my mom he had a big home with a big guest house that we were more than welcome to stay at and his wife wouldn't mind. Immediately, my reaction was no way. No way in the world was I staying in a random guy's house in creepy Maine in the dark. My mom determined this guy was okay. My mom was an investment banker. She said he was in finance and they chatted enough for my mom to determine he wasn't totally full of it. I called my dad hysterical. He said I was overreacting and that I needed to get out of the city more, and accept that sometimes people are just nice. 
So, my brother, sister, and I got into our car and followed him back to his house. The guest house was really nice, fully furnished, but the beds were oddly placed. The guest house had two bedrooms, and instead of the beds being located in the middle, they were right under the window in each room. Just seemed out of place. Anyway, fast forward. We are all getting ready to go to bed. My mom hears a knock on the door, and it's the guy. He said he just wanted to check to make sure we got settled. Cool. Nice thing to do. About 30 minutes later, he comes back to check in again. At this point, my mom said that we were good, and thank you, and we will stop by the house in the morning to say thank you. Fast forward another 30 to 45 minutes. I can't sleep. I'm terrified. We hear this rustling, which is odd, because the guest house was nowhere around trees or close proximity to bushes that might cause such a noise. At this point, I see my mom wide awake and look up at the window. She motions towards the window with her eyes. None of these windows had curtains. The guy said it's because his wife was in the process of redecorating. When I looked up there, there was a male figure just standing. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I don't know how long he was there for. When we walked away, my mom waited a bit and then told us to get our stuff together. She wasn't messing around. We had my dad on the phone at this point. He was pretty much flipping out at my mom about something, but I didn't hear what. My mom said she was going to put stuff in the car and to follow her out. This was around 2 a.m. When we got into the car, we pulled around to the front of the main house so my mom could return the key and say thanks and then get out of there. However, when we got to the front, all of the lights were off. Not just all lights, but it looked like no one had been home. Porch light, table lamp and front windows, everything black. Also, the two cars were gone. The man's car and what we presumed to be his wife's car. After seeing this, my mom, at this point pretty unsettled, said we were leaving and we proceeded to drive to the gate. The gate at the end of the driveway had been deadbolted shut from the inside. It wasn't a super strong gate, so my dad said rev it and just get out of here. We drove straight back to New York City, not speaking the entire time. We have never returned back to Maine, and my parents refused to speak about it. I asked a family member one night about it when he was drunk, and all he said was, They didn't tell you? The actual owners of the house were on vacation. I'm assuming my mom or dad followed up with the local authorities and figured that out, but never told us. I don't know who that man was, or what was planned that evening. I was curious as to whether there were any known serial killers or murderers who were in that area at the time, but I don't want to know. This happened fall of 2017. My sister Gigi was in high school. My parents took a trip out of country, so I was in charge of my sister. I temporarily lived in my parents' house while doing so. I took her to school and back, picked her up when she was at her friend's and boyfriend's house, and picked her up after her church meetings. I was told she started going to regular church on Sundays with her boyfriend and his family, which I'm happy that she's into it. We grew up Catholic, but don't often go to church after we moved to the USA. But also, she was going to another church at nights with a friend of hers. I grew up with Sunday Mass, and that's it. So the thought of spending extra time and free time going back to church was weird. But if she wanted to grow up as an extra-religious person, who am I to stop her? On Monday, she went to school and hung out with her boyfriend. I picked her up from the boyfriend's house. No big deal. Tuesday, 
she went to night church after school with her friend. I was told that she would get a ride home from her friend's mom. She was supposed to be home at 9 p.m. She came in a little late, around 9.40. I asked why, and she said they are preparing for a retreat that Saturday. Seemed all right of an excuse, and I trust her, so no big deal. Wednesday through Thursday, mostly normal. One day she went home after school and we hung out. Another day, she was hanging out with friends. One of these days, she was hanging out with her boyfriend and some friends, and she asked me if she could go to church. This would be the second time going to night church in this week. I remember thinking, when I was in high school, hanging out with friends did not cross with spending free time at church. They ended up not going, which relieved me a little bit. At this point, I was getting weird vibes from the night church. Friday, the day before their retreat, her plans were to go to night church after school and come home at 9 p.m. My plans were to hang out with friends and be home by 9 p.m. too. I'm driving home a little late and text her to not worry her. I got no reply. I waited a bit and texted her again. No reply. I called her. No answer. At this point, I was hoping she was already home, and for some reason went to bed early. But no, the house was empty. I kept calling, texting her, calling, texting, panicking. Around 10.45, almost two hours after she was supposed to be home, she called me. She says that they are still in church preparing for the retreat, that she wasn't allowed to have a cell phone turned on. I'm normally the cool older brother, but I lost it a bit. Not towards her, but just got to the point. I'm coming to get you. Text me the address. I don't care what you're doing. I'm coming to get you. I got a text with the address, and I drove to pick her up. I was a bit calmed down that I heard her voice, but I was pissed at the same time. Once I got there, some lady was outside, waiting for me. She says, sorry for the trouble, we're preparing for tomorrow, that's why Gigi is still here. I said that's fine, but I'm in charge of Gigi for the week, and our parents wanted her home by 9pm every day, so please go get her. She said, well, Gigi can't come out right now. The sermon is not over yet. And at this point, I started to lose patience. What little patience I had left. I said, you bring her out right now, or I'm calling the cops for kidnapping. I'm her legal guardian, and she's under 18. This sparked a light under her feet. The lady started walking inside and invited me inside. She said, do you want to come in? You're welcome to. I said, just go get my sister out. The lady walks inside, and a moment later, my sister and the lady come out. The lady is giving my sister some documents, and a shirt, and some information about tomorrow's retreat. In the car ride home, I'm trying to choose my words very carefully when my sister says, I don't want to go to the retreat tomorrow. Can I stay home and say you aren't letting me go? I said, yes. Turn me into the bad guy. I don't care. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. It turns out that everything up until tonight was normal church things. But tonight they turned it up to 11. People all around were seizing, yelling, throwing up. They were feeding people something which was causing this. And the smoke and the air smelled funny according to my sister. I kept asking my sister if they fed her anything, but she said no. They weren't supposed to feed my sister anything until she goes to her first retreat. The retreat, which the night church said they paid for her, making it seem like they were generous, was supposed to be an initiation, commitment to the place. According to my sister's friend, who already went to the initiation, they gave you something that makes you sick, 
representing the evils that are leaving you, and you feel sick for about a week or two. The people there tonight were scary and didn't look right in the head. I read the stuff they gave my sister, all culty stuff. The place looked like a house that was made to look like a small church. I also later found out from my aunt that their church name did not make sense from a Catholic point of view, and they weren't listed or official. When I was a young girl, maybe seven or eight at the time, I went shopping with my mom at her beloved store, Hobby Lobby. I remember the day very well. I am in my upper 20s now. I even remember the shirt I wore that day because it made me feel pretty and I wore it in a school picture. But now, that shirt is stained in my mind. My mother took quite a while to shop, normally, and I liked looking around myself so I would not stay close to her. We lived in Colorado Springs at the time, so it did not feel unsafe to do so. I was somewhere in the middle of the store, looking at random things, but I look up and notice someone is giving me direct eye contact. Now, I am very polite and unassuming, so I smiled in a friendly way, and he smiled back. I didn't think anything of it, I move along, looking at other things, and notice once again that he is fairly close behind me. I decide to go down an aisle near the back of the store to look at the stickers, still not alarmed yet. While walking down the aisle, I see that once again this stranger is behind me. It was at this point that I realized I was in the corner of the store that wasn't lit well, alone with an older male. I felt the intense need to go back to my mom and get away from him as soon as possible, but unfortunately, my encounter was far from over. I scurry back to my mom, who was deep in thought about whatever craft she is doing. I think at first I am safe, and what to inform my mother of what happened. But as I look around, I see the man staring at me for only a couple feet away. At this point, I am trying to rush my mom out of the store. I don't know how to tell my mom without the man overhearing what I need so desperately to say. But I was so shy and unsure. I wanted to act natural, like I wasn't on to him. But obviously looking back, I would handle it differently. My mother and I continue to roam the store, all while this man follows us around. One might wonder why my mom hasn't noticed yet, and yes, it is a little neglectful on her part. She was that kind of a mother in general, always focused on what she wanted to do at the time, not too concerned with the outside world. She is the classic kid with her face in the book. She was unwavering in his eye contact and proximity. What was truly terrifying was how brazen he was. I continued to rush my mom, pleading with her to hurry up. We ended at the fabric section of Hobby Lobby. If you have been there, you know they have giant rolls of fabric. My mother and I stood at one end of the rolls. At this point, he knows my mom is not paying much attention. So he stands, facing me, on the other end of the rolls. I try to get away from his gaze by moving to the other aisle between the rolls, but he just followed me. He did this over and over again. I am starting to panic and beg my mom to take us home. We finally start walking away towards the registers. I don't see him follow us at this point. We are checking out and I continue to look back and forth around for him. Finally, we have our things and start to leave. Right before the exit, that is where I see him. He is staring me down. I will never forget the look of complete disgust and anger on his face. I would not exaggerate in saying that I saw evil that day, pure and utter evil intention. 
I knew that was strictly because whatever perversion he had on his mind was not fulfilled. I am truly terrified at this point and start crying and rushing my mom to the car. I tell her everything in a rush, putting items in the car and before we leave. I watch for him to make sure he is not following us out. I do not see him again, but cry for a while to my mother. She explains to me that I could have told her and she would have involved management there. But as I stated earlier, I didn't want him to overhear me. I am not old enough to really understand and had not been taught how to deal with the situation. Looking back, I still believe that I would have been kidnapped or raped. He was unrelenting and I wonder at times if he had slipped me out of the back if I would be alive today. I have a little girl of my own now, and I do not let her out of my sight. I once lost sight of her in a Halloween store for two seconds, and lost my mind. It's so strange when this sort of thing happens to you, because in the moment it never feels so serious. Hindsight is 2020, right? I'm living in Japan right now, and my family met me in South Korea last month for a vacation. I've lived in Japan for three years now, and this was my second time visiting Seoul. But the first time I found myself in such a bizarre situation there. My family and I were touring a famous palace in Seoul. The grounds are pretty vast but at least a mile or two of walking to cover the whole thing. About halfway through our visit, we break and sat down on the ledge of one of the structures. A German tour group came through the same passage and paused for a few minutes so the tour guide could explain the history of that particular area. German people took seats around us along with one Korean guy who we thought nothing of at the time. After all, we were in Korea. After a couple of minutes, my family and I decide to move on and head to the cafe near the entrance of the palace. The tour group had obviously stayed behind, but one guy got up around the same time we did. Yeah, the one Korean guy. We didn't realize until about five to ten minutes outside of that area but one of my sisters pointed out that this guy had been following our path very closely, enough to be suspicious. By the way, it's worth mentioning that we had seven people in our group. Me, my two sisters, my mom and dad, my uncle, and my brother-in-law. We definitely had the power and numbers thing going for us. My family is also incredibly confrontational when we need to be. So after my sisters and I noticed something weird was going on, we stopped walking, and the guy stopped walking too. So we all gave him a very obvious stare down, to which he responded by looking very intently at the ground. Strange, but okay, we decide to carry on. And again, this guy decided to follow. By this time, the rest of our family is catching on, so we decided to make a stop near one of the gates that leads to the main part of the palace to see if he stops again. Sure enough, he does, and sits himself down on the ground, trying to play it off like he's doing his own thing. We give it another minute or two to look like we're having a conversation before moving along again. And you guessed it, this guy stands up and tails us right to the center of the main palace building, where we stop again when we see he's still following. This time, there's not really anywhere natural to stop and take a seat, so he stops dead in his tracks a couple feet away from us. At this point, there's no way anyone can deny that he's straight up stalking us. So my dad and uncle turn right to him and say, Is there a reason why you're following us? Maybe this guy couldn't understand much English, but I think the sentiment was probably pretty obvious. 
but the guy doesn't even try to respond. Doesn't even make eye contact with them. He's just silent, staring kind of dead-eyed at the ground. My sisters and brother-in-law and I decide at this point that we've got to find someone who works there. There's nothing inherently threatening about this guy, but something about him is kind of eerie. I mean, on the top of the fact that he's been overly stalking us for over 20 minutes at this point. There are no guards or staff in the immediate area, so we all pick up the pace, and of course, our guy picks up the pace right behind us as we head over to the cafe. My brother-in-law and I get to the cafe first and find a staff member at the counter. We tell her what's going on and she seems to understand immediately and goes to get her supervisor from the back. By the time the staff member and her supervisor come back out, this guy is in the cafe. So I pointly direct at him and tell the two staff members, that's him. The guy again doesn't make any eye contact whatsoever, but obviously the jig is up. So he power walks his way out of the cafe and back onto the grounds. The staff member follows him out and talks to my sister and mom to let them know that if we have any more problems with this guy to let them know. I know that's kind of an anticlimactic ending but that's the last we saw of him, thankfully. The reaction of the staff kind of made me wonder if this guy had a habit of stalking tourists on the palace grounds. We realized after the fact that he must have been tagging along with the German tour group beforehand. Maybe he thought we were a tour group that he could blend into, but while seven people is a large number, it's definitely not large enough to go unnoticed especially when we're a family who's going to question the new member. In the end, my uncle and I kind of assumed he was probably just a perv trying to get close to an exotic foreigner. I've been stalked in Japan in similar ways before, and my uncle who lives in Asia said similar things happen to women where he lives, but never in a group setting like this. I guess we'll never know this man's true intentions, but I am glad that we never crossed paths with him again for the rest of the trip. This particular story takes place over the span of a year. At the time, I was probably about eight or nine years old, living with my mom in a small apartment, and my grandmother lived in the apartment below ours. We lived in the middle of a not-so-great town, but I loved being outdoors, and I had a lot of older male cousins who lived with my grandmother on and off. They would come out and keep an eye on me, for the most part, while my mom was busy. I don't remember a lot of the details, but it was summertime, and I went next door to my cousin Leah's house to play. They let us out to play alone for some reason, which I wasn't technically allowed to do, but I figured I wasn't technically home, and that was a home rule. While we were in the alley behind our apartments, an older boy, probably about 15 to 16 years old, stumbled up to us and I remember the immense smell of alcohol that radiated off of him. I froze in my spot. The teenager starts wobbling back and forth and starts screaming in my face. Where's my money? I told you I needed my money. I need my money. This guy is screaming at a child some nonsense about borrowed money, and I'm absolutely terrified. I'm locked into one spot, and I'm crying. Leah comes to her senses and yanks me away by my arm, and we take off towards my grandma's house, which was safer than her own, since there really wasn't much supervision on her parents' end. The whole time, the boy just stood and stared as we ran. We tumble in the back door, crying, 
and relive it to my family over and over again until my cousins decide to scope out the area. He wasn't found, and I didn't have the best description in the first place, being young and terrified. My mom even took me to a party up the alley where we had suspected he came from, but he was either hiding or had left, so I was unable to identify him. The boys come out and watch us, and Leah ends up spending the night. Cut to bedtime, and we're in the bathroom brushing our teeth and goofing off. We had a tiny bathroom, so the toilet, sink, and window were pretty much crammed into one corner. Suddenly, someone's screaming in my backyard. Because of the town and family I grew up in, we assumed it was a fight between my neighbors and my cousins, or just between my cousins. Both happened pretty frequently. But being the little gossips we were, we turned straight to the window and settled ourselves to watch. Only, it wasn't any of them. It was the drunk teenager from earlier, and he was waving something in his hand, still screaming about the non-existent borrowed money. When the light finally hit the object he had been brandishing, Leah screams that he has a gun. Immediately we drop to the ground, screaming and crying, and unable to form coherent sentences. My mom swoops in, shuts the blinds, and ushers us down to my grandma's, where everybody erupts into chaos. The whole night was spent giving statements to the police, calling uncles, and generally just trying to calm Leah and I down, because we were in absolute hysterics. He was never found, and life was fairly normal till school started. My teachers and the principal were informed of the situation beforehand, but nothing prepared me for the day mid-fourth grade year when I walked out of elementary school to find this boy and his friends sitting across the street where they technically weren't on school grounds. I tried to justify it. Maybe he had little siblings or maybe he was just hanging out. But I knew in my heart he was waiting for me. I tried to walk home but as soon as I would walk in one direction him and the group of teenagers would match it from across the street till I shifted directions again and then they would follow suit. Not even a block from the school, I made an executive decision to bolt back the way that I came and tell a teacher. All hell broke loose again and more police, but the kid was smart. When I ran, he'd taken off as well and he was again not found. My mom started picking me up and dropping me off to school after that, so things quieted down a bit. But there were still times in the couple minute window I'd be standing alone when I would see him standing across the street just watching. The last incident I never even connected to this situation until years later. He had stopped showing up at my school almost as abruptly as he had started. I eventually begged, pleaded, argued, and cried, enough for my mom to start letting me walk home with Leah again. In hindsight, it was a terrible idea, but I was a really spoiled kid. One afternoon, I split off from the group of kids that Leah and I had been walking with and headed towards the apartment. Because it was an apartment building, the entrance was set up kind of odd. The first door you entered basically just led you to a second door, which then took you to a hallway where directly to the right was my grandma's apartment door, and straight ahead was my mom's and I's door. When I approached the entrance, I noticed the first door was open, but okay, whatever, it's not that unusual for my cousins to have left it open, so I step in, took two steps forward, and went to open the second door. This door was open as well. Now that was weird. I didn't know why at the time, but my grandmother used to be adamant about shutting that door because my older cousin smoked weed and she didn't want the neighbors to smell it and call the cops. 
I ignored it again and continued walking down the hallway when I reached my apartment door to find it standing wide open. My instincts finally kicked in and I bolted. Nobody was at my grandmother's house at the time, so I had a neighbor go up and check the apartment. No sign of forced entrance. Nothing stolen. Nothing even rummaged through. I can't prove that it was him. Hell, we didn't even think it was an option back then, because he had finally left me alone. But only my mother and myself had keys. And if it had been my cousins breaking in, they would have stolen something, anything of value, to feed their addictions. The door had been closed and locked, up until the point of my grandmother leaving, so it wasn't an accident. It wasn't an I forgot to lock the door scenario. <laughs>